الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين. So, a couple of weeks ago, I finished the series of lectures that we were going through the rights of the parents. And the topic that I wanted to kind of wrap up that subject before we move into the next subject is ikram <coughs> or takrim, karam, the concept in Islam and in the Quran and in the Hadith of honoring others, especially as it relates to family. How do we honor our entire family? The whole series of lectures, the book that we were going through of Sheikh Muhammad Mawlud Rahimahullah was about honoring the parents, honoring the parents, honoring the parents, all of the different ways that we honor the parents in our, the way we speak to them, in our body, the way we act around them, in our wealth, how we support them. And then at the end, it was just a very short uh, point about how do we honor our children. And the point that was made there was that parents are naturally inclined towards honoring their children. But children don't necessarily have that same inclination towards their parents, so there has to be more specific, this is what you do, this is how you say, and so forth, more, more rules that are given. Um, but when we look at this concept of honoring, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored the human being, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي Adam. Allah says in the Quran that He has honored human beings. And in the same way that He has honored us, we have to then honor ourselves and respect the body that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, take care of it, use it for the proper purposes, and then honor those people around us and do um, in the same way that we would ex expect the generosity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reach us, then in the same way we want it to reach others. So as an example, one time there was a, there's a, a narration where a man came to Ibrahim alayhi salam. And Ibrahim alayhi salam, his story in the Quran and a number of locations and also in the hadith, there's a, there's a, there's a theme of honoring the guests. Of honoring the guests. And one, one example is when the angels came to give him the news that his wife would have a child, the firstborn, Ismail alayhi salam, or in some narrations it was Ishaq alayhi salam. Uh, but when those two, uh, those angels came to give uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam the, the, God, the news that his wife would have a child, and then later on they would go to destroy the people of Qom Lut for the, um, the lifestyle choice that they had made. Uh, one of the things that you'll notice in the story is that before Ibrahim alayhi salam, he didn't ask them, would you like to have a meal? They came as guests, he went slaughtered a calf, Ijlin Samin, a, a, a fat calf, slaughtered it, cooked it, and brought it to them, and then placed it before them. And then he says, Ala ta'kulun, will you not eat? And they didn't say anything, فَأَوْجَسَ مِنْهُمْ خِيفَةً Then he, he got scared, because he realized he wasn't talking to human beings, he was talking to angels in the form of human beings, and he knows that angels come to the prophets only with very specific messages. It's either they're bringing wahi or they're bringing adab, they're bringing a punishment. Because before the Prophet ﷺ, we see consistently Nuh salam's people destroyed, the people of Shu'ayb destroyed, the people of, uh, uh, of, of Salih destroyed, the people of Hud destroyed. All of this is happening. And as a side note, one of the rahmas, you know, when we read in the Quran that the Prophet ﷺ is rahmatan lil alameen, when Allah sent him, he made a promise that he would never completely make a, uh, uh, destroy a nation as part of the mercy that the Prophet brought to the world. So Ibrahim ﷺ sees them and he, he's, he's afraid now. Um, he, 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 he kind of goes back. And then they tell him the news, they, they, they go, it goes through the story. The point I wanted to mention about there is that some of the adab, some of the etiquettes of honoring the guests, we take from this story. One of the things is when the guests come, the, just the adab, the etiquette, go prepare something, don't ask them, would you like to eat, would you like to drink? Go ahead and prepare it, and then present it. 
And then you ask them, would you? Because it's more likely that a guest, I think we've all been in both situations. We've hosted people and we've been the guests. We might not feel comfortable. We might be thirsty and we want a drink of water or we would like a cup of tea. Everybody's been in that situation, right? Where you really would like a cup of tea or a cup of coffee, right? And you're just wondering like, are they gonna offer it? Because I could really use a cup right now. Um, and you won't ask for it. And if they asked you, would you like something to drink or eat out of modesty, you might say no. But if they presented it and then they asked you, you're more likely to accept it. So it's kind of like it's your, your, you're making it easier on the guests to accept your, your, your honoring of them. In Arabic, it's called the qira, what you present for, um, or the nuzul. Um, in the Quran it mentions about the, the kuffar as in their punishment فَنُزُلٌ مِنْ حَمِيمٌ that the, the, the preparation of the guest as they enter Jahannam is fire and it's, it's an interesting way of presenting it the nuzul is what you present to the guest and so it's a kind of a almost a sarcastic way of saying oh yeah you're going to be real uh, you know فَذُقْ إِنَّكَ you know فَذُقْ إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْعَزِيزُ الْكَرِيمُ is it? There's that ayah. In any case, there. Um, okay, so going back to Ibrahim alayhi salam, he's mentioned about you know we take him as a as a qudwa, as a guide for us on how to honor the guest. Well, one time, a guest comes to his house and he presents food to him, and then he starts calling him to Islam because the person he finds out is a mushrik, associates partners with Allah, and so starts calling him to tawheed, to believing in the oneness of Allah, and the man refuses. He says, I'm not going, to, not going to do it. And then Ibrahim says, well, if you're not going to accept my, you know, becoming Muslim, then leave. I have no point in giving you food. And the man takes off. He leaves. And then Allah sends a revelation to Ibrahim alayhi salam saying, I have fed and sustained this person for 100 years, knowing full well that he associates partners with me. And now all you had to do was give him a meal and you couldn't do that? And so then the story goes, Ibrahim goes out, finds the man, says, please, please come back. The man's astonished now. You know, Ibrahim had just kicked him out for not becoming Muslim. And then he, uh, he finds him, you know, completely changed. And he explains, I just got revelation, my Lord. He reminded him, that's not, that wasn't proper, especially for you in your station of a prophet. And so then, then the, the man himself, he's taken and he becomes Muslim. But the, the point of that is that, is that sometimes, you know, so you have, we have these two stories. We have Ibrahim and he's showing the, the, um, the, the angels that cut him. And then sometimes, you know, it, it takes over. Sometimes we forget what we should be doing, the higher road that we should be taking and reminding ourselves that if in the same way that we want something from Allah, we should be able to give out the same thing. So sometimes when people hold grudges, I remember one time somebody told me this story that there was a person that was really just holding a grudge against somebody. And somebody came and says, why can't you just forgive him? Won't you just let it go? He says, no, I'll, I'll never forgive him. And I think we can all relate, you know, we, we either know somebody who holds on to a grudge and that almost becomes a part of themselves, or maybe we've done it ourselves for days, months, weeks. We just hold on to it. And the problem is it, it becomes... If we hold on to it too much, it becomes part of our identity. Then we, then we think that, oh, this, this, this unforgivingness is actually part of who I am. And then it makes it that much harder to, to let go. So this person said, well, do, don't you want Allah to forgive you? Yeah, of course. And then he realized, well, in the same way that the person was telling me, he said, in the same way that you want Allah to forgive you, and to not hold anything against you, because Allah could say, look, you did this, angels take him to the hellfire. I'm not going to forgive you. It's not emotional for Allah. It's not like how we are humans, we hold on to things out of emotion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is completely different than his creation. So he doesn't punish or reward out of emotion. It's not like human emotions, like what we can comprehend. But he has rules set up. If you do this, you can have Jannah. And if you do this, you will go to the hellfire. So if we come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has, the, in his justice, he could put us towards the hellfire. But at that point, we would want Allah to forgive it. And in Ramadan, which is coming up, one of the things that we, we ask, Allahumma innaka afuun tuhibbul afwa. What's the difference between maghfirah and afu? 
forgiveness and afu. It's a, it's a, so, you know, sometimes we ask for Allah to forgive us and sometimes we ask Him, Allahumma afu anna, O oh Allah, uh, pardon us. And they said the difference between it is the maghfirah, it's like when, when a person is presented and, and, and it's discussed and it's known. And he says, okay, I am now forgiving this person for that sin. So everybody knows what that person did, but he's forgiven. But the people still know what he or she did. Afu is where Allah pardons it and no and it's and it is not even he nobody is told about it So on Yom Qiyamah or the angels are removing it from the books. It's come. It's it's sealed. It's hidden It's like uh, what is it? You know when people before the 18 if things happen, what do they call that when the um, their records are sealed or Expunged. Expunged yeah, so it's expunged from the records. It's redacted. It's come. It's like it never existed That's Afu. So it's even a higher level of of what we're what we want from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there's even a hadith that you know on the day of judgment when our books are presented and may Allah make our books full of good deeds and forgiven for all our bad deeds there's some people that they will present their books and then Allah will tell the angels keep the book closed give the book to the person says you know what you did I forgive you for what was wrong go to Jannah no hisab, no, no accounting at all, at all. So that's what we want from Allah. We, we're asking for that. So while we're crying and turning to Allah and asking for that for us, now we turn to our fellow human beings, how do we interact with them? So in the same way that Allah is, honors us, He gives us food, He gives us clothing, He gives us the ability to work, He gives us all of these things. And so, just like Ibrahim, you give to that person, you give out of karam, pure, true karam, true generosity, is not contingent upon anything. And that's where the parents are coming in, right? They give to their children, even when their child is, 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 is yelling at them, is, uh, uh, well, I'm going to feed you, I'm going to clothe you, I'm going to, you know, that's, that's what a human being does. That's, how, that's part of how Allah has honored us, He's put that within us to give to other people. So if that's, that's what we want from Allah, we want the honoring and the generosity from Allah, then we turn and we should have that same attitude in the same way with the for, for, forgiveness. So, so part of honoring when we, when we interact with other people is to meet them where they are and to respect, to respect who they are. So when people would come into the, 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 the majlis, the gathering of the Prophet wasallam, he wouldn't treat them as if this person doesn't have any history, a blank slate, now I'm going to impart wisdom upon him. And what he would do is he would find out about that person. Tell me about your people. Tell me about what you've experienced. And then even when he's teaching, you'll see this in a lot of the ahadith, you'll see, he doesn't just tell people things, he also asks them questions. Don't we see that? In a, haven't we seen in a lot of the ahadith, the Prophet's asking questions. Well, if he's asking questions, what does that mean? This, in the modern, um, now in the, in the modern literature of education, they call this the student-centered approach. So we have this, you know, the Prophet ﷺ is teaching us this. But what, what, what the shift is, is in the education, is it a teacher-centered approach or is it a student-centered approach? The teacher-centered approach is the sage on the stage. The teacher is just teaching, 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 and not respecting or not uh, giving any weight to what the student brings into the classroom. So now, and some of you who have, who have your kids maybe in school now, do your kids tell you that they do a lot of group projects? Yeah? And for, do you notice like from your schooling, the shift, like we didn't have as many group projects? We didn't have those, right? So what's the, what's the difference? The difference is, is that on that teacher-centered approach, the, the understanding in education is that, oh, the teacher has all the answers, the teacher has all the wisdoms, the teacher has all the right answers, so all the student needs to do is just be quiet, sit still at your desk, don't move, take notes, listen, and ask questions, you know, for clarifications from that wisdom of the sage on the stage, they call it. But the student-centered approach is more of a guide on the side. The teacher is respecting that each student, as they come into the classroom, they're respecting what they're bringing in, too. They're bringing in their own personal experience. 
they're bringing, bringing in maybe outside learning, right? Every student is different. Now, I'm, I'm using the, 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 the language of student and teacher, but you can apply this in your home as a parent. You can apply this as a friend when you're interacting with your friends. You can apply, uh, uh, um, um, apply this in the, in, the, in the workplace where it's not just kind of the, the sage on the stage where the person is, 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 is announcing all of the truth that there needs to be, there needs to be said and not taking and seeing where, where people are. And part of that, so when I started reading about this, I said, SubhanAllah, this is the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Wouldn't we say that? That when we read his seerah, it's, it's not all about he's, 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 he's just giving, it's like one-way conversations. Sometimes he is mentioning things. Sometimes he's listening to the conversations of his Sahaba. Sometimes he's listening and then approving or even a smile. He might, he might hear them have a conversation. He might see them interact and he just looks at it and he smiles. And in that look and the smile, he's taught us a huge lesson. He's saying, I'm approving this lesson right here. And in, so when we talk about the sunnah, there's three elements. There's his speech, there's his actions, and there's his approvals. So we always think, of, oh, the sunnah, is, uh, the hadith, something he said. Yes, true, it's something he said, or it's something he did, or he saw somebody else do something, and he approved it. And, and that approval could even come in, he didn't say anything. He, and so when they read a hadith, they call this uh, taqrir. Basically, it's called tacit approval. So it means he accepted it. So what's happening in that taqrir? That's what's, what, what he's seeing is that he's saying, these, this, this person or these people from within themselves have come up with something that is haq, is a true statement or a true action, and I'm accepting it. Either by saying, follow this person, like in the, the situation of the... Um, um, one of the Sahaba where he asked them, would you like to see a man of Jannah? And they said, yeah. He said, look at this man. And he didn't say what he did, right? He didn't say. So what did one of the Sahaba do? He wants to find out what he did. What he, did. he followed him home and he asked him. He said, he said the Prophet وسلم, pointed you out and said that um, if we want to see a person of Jannah, it's you. What is it that you do? He said, I don't know other than the fact that every night before I go to sleep, I, tell, I, I forgive anybody that has anything against me. Like if, if, I, if I'm owed anything by anybody, I just let it go. I forgive them. Now look in that, in that simple interaction of the Prophet Sallallahu what does he do? Basically, in the, like in a modern, uh, it would be the teacher giving the student a project. Here, I'm gonna give you a project. Here's your hint. That man has something. Now when that Sahaba got up, and he went to look for him and he's now more motivated and he's interested in, in, in learning and he finds it himself. And then that's the other thing too, the fact that he figured it out on his own. Imagine how he must have felt as a talib al-ilm. The word in Arabic for the student of knowledge is not a, you know, daris al-ilm, he studied knowledge. It's talib al-ilm, which would more be, would be translated better as what? requesting or seeking yeah requesting as talaba or seeking so you, it's it's a process that you have to actively do the prophet sallallahu could have easily said if any of you wants to go to jannah forgive people bam that's it but he included his a sahaba in the process and now that sahaba then goes and he narrates and so we get the we get the whole story but look at those people he affirmed what that it's that man something that man is doing and maybe he just figured it out on his own we don't know that part of the hadith like, how did that Sahabi take as a practice forgiving people on a nightly basis? And then the other Sahabi saying, okay, I need to figure out what's going on, and goes and follows him. So, what's going on here, when I look at it, the Prophet is honoring those people by respecting their individuality, by respecting what they can figure out, he's honoring them. He's, he's respecting that. So, how do we do that in our, in our, in our homes? Uh, with our with our friends when we have conversations with them when we talk that's why it's important important to to get feedback and to ask and to you know and to have conversations uh, recently I came across a um, a diagram of what a good group discussion should be and I'll give you I wish I had a board to draw it on but if you could just imagine these three circles so the first circle is kind of what I'm doing here I'm sitting over here and I'm just talking. 
And so all of the points are just going out this way. There's no two-way. Okay, so that's one circle, one group. The next group is where maybe I'm having a conversation with two people over here, and then two people over there are having a conversation. That's not really a group conversation, right? The third circle is where me, as the facilitator in the group, I'm not, uh, I'm not saying anything, and somebody else takes over the group. Everybody, anybody ever been in a halaqa where somebody where it's taken over by somebody else? One of the attendees takes over the halaqa. So that's also not the healthy. But the healthiest one is where people are having, where the, 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 the directions of the conversation are crisscrossing the circle. Can you imagine those four circles? So the best one is that where the, the conversations are going out, all, all four ways. Now when you think about the stories that you've read of the Prophet ﷺ in his majlis, in his gathering, doesn't it seem like it's the fourth one? Because he would sometimes have, he would say something, and then another Sahaba would respond, and then another Sahaba would respond to that Sahaba, then they would have a conversation, and then the Prophet would, you know, affirm that, and then he might mention, and so it was, this, it was this group dialogue. So now how can we bring that into our homes, into our businesses, into our teams, our management teams, if we're, in, if we're in a, uh, on a job, whether it's, whether it's a laborer job, contractor job, uh, whatever it might be, it has to be two-way conversations and uh, across, uh, across, the, uh, across that, that group so that we can have more of a, of, um, a sunnah uh, group, uh, group dialogue. Uh, so that's something I, I just wanted to mention about, the, uh, about re what respecting, uh, respecting what the individual brings into the classroom or into the group. So to give you a, uh, an example today, one of our groups... Um, one of the boys groups and he just shared this with me it was the fourth and fifth groups and they were going to talk about a very serious topic the topic of death and it's on our minds as a community here locally we missed uh, uh, we lost somebody a very dear member of our uh, community here a few weeks ago sister Najaya uh, and her father Abdul Haq is here um, if you haven't given him condolences please do and to the family, and they, they were very regular part. Um, uh, his wife, Najaya's mother, is one of the regular teachers here. And so it's, it's, it's affected the whole community in terms of, you know, we're, we're, we're grappling with this. Um, we're missing somebody very dear to, to the community. Um, and, then <clears throat> and then just in general, so the topic came up of, of death and how to cope with it. And so... I had asked, uh, actually in preparation for this halaqa, I asked uh, some mental health professionals, I said, how can we talk to the youth about death? Because we do want to have this conversation. You know, it does, it, we want it to be uh, normalized in the sense that it's part of our conversation. Um, it's not to where we hide it and we don't talk about it. And then you'll probably, has anybody ever talked with an adult and the, 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 the discussion of death came up and they're like, please, please stop, don't talk about it. Anybody ever met somebody like just a raise of hands? Yeah, some people. So there's adults who, in that sense, for, for us as Muslims, we would say they haven't matured enough to be able to have that discussion. So how do you develop that maturity? Well, we see the Prophet ﷺ has mentioned, he says, mention it in your gatherings. Mention, mention death so it becomes part of, of, of um, you know, the normal conversation. We talk about life, we talk about birthdays, we talk about graduations. Well, where is it that we normalize the discussion about death? So I asked one of the, uh, a therapist, I said, okay, we're going to bring this discussion into our youth halaqa. How can we, we bring it up? And one of the advice that was given is that don't start off just talking about it. Ask what they know about it. And so that's this, this, this idea of rather than just giving the counselors over there just, okay, here's the talking points. This is what you need to talk about with the boys. Um, this, is, this is what you, uh, you know, ask them. And so I just asked one of the, the, the groups and he said the fourth and fifth graders, he said it's been the most mature conversation of the entire year where they just really took it very seriously and they each shared something and they were sharing something very personal of how they dealt with it. And uh, even as fourth and fifth graders, they had a very mature way of, you know, about speaking about that. And so what that shows is a couple of things. When they came into the room, they don't need to be taught, right? Like if we had looked at us, okay, they, you know, obviously, so we're, we're, we wouldn't be doing a couple of things. We wouldn't be respecting them. Maybe some of the books that they've read, because a lot of even novels, they have the discussion of, of death. Um, anybody ever read this book, Bridges, Bridges of Terabithia or Bridges to Terabithia? Anybody familiar? Are you familiar with that? 
Um, it's a, it's a, I, I won't give you a spoiler, but it's a good book to, um, to, to, to have that conversation with like maybe 10 years, uh, 10 year, nine, nine years and above kids. It's, it's a novel, it's fiction, uh, but it brings it up in a very real way. Um, so, so whether it's they're reading about it, whether they're thinking about it, maybe they had a pet who passed away, maybe they had a family member who passed away, maybe they went to a, that's why it's so, to me, when I go to any janazah and we, you see the families who bring their children to the janazah, that's, that's huge. You know, we don't know what, what effect is happening. Not all learning happens in the, in the masjid or, you know, from behind a microphone in front of a person speaking. It's a lot of that is that th those, um, those experiences that you're, that, you're, that, you, that you're part of their lives and taking them to the cemetery, having a conversation with them in the car about it, talking about it when, when the news of something, uh, something happens. And so when we ask the question, what is it that you know? about this topic we're honoring that individual and then we're honoring the primary teachers of those children which are the families so um, this is you know uh, uh, um, uh, a testimony to to what you have done as family members in preparing your children and talking to them about that they can have this mature uh, this mature conversation um, so I wanted to leave some time for for questions and just end on that the the the, the concept of um, of, of honoring the, the individual and what they bring. And this can go in, into so many different um, domains. Even if it's, in a, if it's in a tech company, if it's at a hospital, if it's at college, um, when, you're, when you're working with other people, when you're studying with other people, if you respect what they have, you'll also, you'll, you know, by honoring them, people like to be honored with a good meal and so forth, but they also like to be honored with one of the most the, the thing that Allah has honored us the most with, even though, yeah, food is part of it. In fact, one of Ibn Abbas said that ayah of وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ We have ennobled human beings. بِأَنْ جَعَلْنَا لَهُمْ أَيْدٍ يَأْكُلُونَ بِهَا That we have given them hands that they can eat. So part of it, we don't even think about it. But if you look at most animals, when they have to eat, what do they do? They put the most honorable part of their body, the face. Right? The face is the most honorable part of the body. They have to put their face in their food. Horses, cows, mice, dogs, cats, whatever it is. They have to put it down. Maybe there's a few exceptions you know, to, to that rule. Anybody ever seen like, uh, I guess, uh, hmm? what's that? Oh, squirrels. Yeah, squirrels. Uh, hmm? Giraffe. Giraffe. Oh, yeah, giraffe don't have, unless they're eating from the ground, but if they're eating at the top. Uh, but I, I, one time I was in Mauritania and there was... Um, uh, there was a National Geographic. There's one of these nature shows going on. And so they showed some animals that were, that were eating. And then the person, we were eating, we were actually eating in a plate. And they were, they were watching this nature show. And then one of them, he's just looking at the animals. He's like, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ You know, like we have ennobled uh, Bani Adam. Uh, but, there, but the ennoblement that Allah has given us comes in, in many different ways. And one of the biggest things is our intellect and our language. الرحمن علم القرآن خلق الإنسان علمه البيان. How many times does Allah tell us in the Quran one of the things in the creation of Adam عليه السلام وعلم آدم الأسماء. He taught Adam language to where the angels didn't have that. In the Rahman, he he has taught you communication. Bayan is even more inclusive than just just than just uh, speech. Um, so. If you're speaking with somebody and you actually honor them by saying, well, what's your opinion on this? Your spouse, your child, your friend, your fellow student, your student, your teacher, you know, to have that, people will feel honored. And I think we can all share, you know, understand from our experience and being treated like that. And, and uh, I remember as a fourth grader, my favorite teacher was not my home school, my homeroom teacher. He was another fourth grade teacher, or sorry, fifth grade. And I wish I had him. But one of the things that really, like, I, I think now, go, looking back, he used to always ask me, oh, hey, Rami, how are you doing? And I used to like learning facts, like, you know, little uh, interesting science facts. And so he's like, you got anything else to share? And I would tell him, and he'd be like, wow, that's amazing. And I, it was a genuine interest. There was things I was telling him, you know, I could tell he wasn't just like kind of being, uh, what is it called, where, uh, um, what's that word, where they're just uh, patronizing me? Yeah, what were you going to say? Oh, just, he wasn't fake. He wasn't patronizing me. He was actually, wow. Like I remember one time I told him, I said, did you know that people used to think that elephant skulls were cyclops skulls? Because the hole for the trunk 
is kind of high and it looks like one eye because the, the eyes for the elephant, I think it's small and it's on the side. So people would find elephant trunks and they'd be like, oh, this is proof that Cyclops exists. Uh, so I told him that and he was just like floored, like, oh, I can't believe it. But it was in one, just one of those little kids' science magazines that I had. Um, but that, to me, now looking at it, is like he honored me by what I brought into that conversation. And so now our question is for us, how do we do that? How do we do that with our children, with our friends, with our coworkers, employers, employees, and so forth? Um, and I want to give a few minutes to, for, for any questions that anybody might have, either about this topic or any of the previous um, halakhas that we had about Bidr al And honor you. I took 50 minutes, you know. <laughs> or maybe not 50 minutes, 40 minutes, half an hour. Any questions? Yes. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Muhammad, nice to meet you. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Thank you. I was, I was, uh, one, I was wondering that I don't back in the topic of making for the material world or just dirt or something like they had to buy it or they for, for like really? so many quantities they were making it and how stupid how big they were like I was wondering what they were using like they had lots of people to work for them or Oh uh, very good question. Uh, so the question is about Ibrahim alayhi salam and Azar, uh, and Azar who used to make the idols, um, and what was the material that they made the idols from? Because, you know, was it a lot of idols? Did they have people working for them? What, you know, um, what was it? Uh, in terms of the idols, I don't know. I'll have to look at the tafsir of that. I can get back to you next week, inshallah. And does anybody, has anybody heard anything about that? The actual material? Um, I haven't, but I, I mean, no, I know in that period, because we know they're from the area of modern day Iraq, so the Babel, uh, Babylon area. Um, uh, they were making idols, very tall idols, sometimes out of stone. The specific idols that Ibrahim alayhi salam, uh, they were making, uh, not him, because Ibrahim never made the idols himself, but they were being made at the time. Their specific material, I don't know. I'm sure it's mentioned in the tafsir, I'll look it up. Uh, but whatever it was, it could be broken by an ax. So we know that. So it's not necessarily maybe like a hard stone or because Ibrahim went into the room and he smashed them with a, I guess an ax, you can break some stones, you know, but he was able to, when they went out for their festival, he was able to destroy all of the idols except for the big one and then hang the ax on the, on, on, on the big one. But I'll look into see what exactly uh, the material was. Um, but over, over time, you know, the materials ranged from, um, at the time of the Sahaba, sometimes they would make it out of dates. They would make it their, their idols out of dates. So it was like an edible idol. And if they ever got hungry, they'd eat it. Um, uh, so I guess that would be uh, <laughs> like a sustainable uh, idol creation. You know, they're not using synthetic materials. Um, but they would make them out of wood. They would make them out of pretty much any material. Human beings, unfortunately, you know, they can easily get sidetracked. Um, an interesting point about like the making of idols is the story of in Nuh salam, at his time there was a certain number of idols that they used to worship and they had specific names Yaghuth wa Ya'uq wa Nasra you know and some of the other names that they, they had so they used to worship these idols with those names but now when we look at the tafsir we say where do these come from the names of those people were actually human beings who lived and walked and were actually good people believed in Allah and did good actions of, of righteousness but the trick that shaitan played on them, when he came to them, he wanted to get them, because they, that was very close to the time of Adam alayhi salam. So, it, you know, kufr and disbelief was not as widespread. So he wants to get these people to, to disbelieve. So how does he do it? The first generation after these very, very good people pass away and their, um, uh, you know, their communities afterwards uh, mourn them, he would say, you know what you should do? You should make images of those people so that you could remind them you know like a picture somebody might have right so so make a picture at those time it was an idol so make a picture and then make sure everybody knows their names and then you can you know whenever you feel sad you can go and look at the the statue and it reminds you of that person so then he got you them used to that because it wasn't something that they had uh previously done then he started saying bring them offerings of food 
You know, if you really want to show your honoring to your, to your dead loved ones, bring them these honorings of food. So then they would do that. Now, you put that in, in a couple of generations, five, six, seven generations down the road, people start forgetting why it was that they did this in the first place. And that can happen very quickly. There's a joke. I don't know if it's true or not, but there was a lady and um, she learned to cook with her mother. And then when she got married, um, she married a man and she said when he would bring a chicken home for her to cook, she would cut one leg off the chicken, put it in the freezer and cook the rest of the chicken. And he said, why do you do that? Why don't you just cook the whole chicken? She's like, nope, that's the way I saw my mom do it. And that's the way you cook a chicken. You cut one leg off and you put that in the freezer and you cook the rest of it. It's like, that doesn't make sense. So the next time he saw his mother-in-law, he's like, you know, your daughter-in-law is doing this, you know, cut the leg off the chicken. And she's like, and says that that's how you taught her how to cook a chicken. She's like, no, she doesn't understand. We only had one pot that wasn't big enough for a whole chicken. So we had to cut off a leg so that it would fit in the pot. And I would put the rest in the freezer, you know, cook it separately. That's the only reason that we did that. But she took it on like that was like, you know, ta'abudi, like that's how you do it. Now imagine if that had maintained a few generations, pretty soon they were like, you know, it's shirk if you try to cook the whole chicken, you know, together. And that's how like bid'ah can happen. So that's what, you know, shaitan was banking on the bid'ah. He's like, okay, look, you just get this into them a couple generations. Pretty soon the game of tel telephone, especially in intergenerationally, they're going to forget the original reason. And then pretty soon by the time of Nuh alayhi salam, they are, it's full blown shirk. They are, they are considering these idols their gods. They have the name of the original people, but it's full-blown shirk and idol worship. And that's how shaitan uh, plays with us. But very good question. I'll, I'll look into that, inshallah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, you Googled it. Sheikh Google Ibn Yahu, yeah. Wood and stone. Wood and stone, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. He had brother in law question. Walaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Mm. Yeah. So the question is, how did the Prophet him honor the non-Muslims? And was there a line that he ever uh, drew uh, with them? I would say, if you look in the 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 um, um, the, the Sira literature and the hadith, he honored all. He honored people. He honored animals. Uh, <clears throat> there's beautiful stories of how he, how he took care of animals and even spoke to animals and honored them and so forth. So I would say that honoring happened to everybody and there was no, there was no division. Now, would he give preference to his family, which is just normal? You know, he would, uh, but we even see uh, one, one very good example of how he honored somebody is his uncle Abu Talib. He had a lot of respect for him, a lot of devotion to him, uh, to the point that when he passed away, when Abu Talib passed away, it was one of the three things that caused the Amul Huzun, the year of sadness. It was the death of Khadija, عنه, who was his wife, a Muslim, the first Muslim, the first one who believed in him. His first, like, just to think of like Khadija and who she is. She's one of the, her passing was one of the reasons of, of Amul Huzun, the, the year of sadness. Then Ta'if, and just imagine, you know, the, the, the treatment that he received in Ta'if, that was another reason, and then the death of Abu Talib. And so just the fact that he had that much emotion for Abu Talib passing, even though he wasn't Muslim, shows you that he had a lot of respect, uh, respect for him. But there's, other, there's, there's many other examples. I would just say like kind of in, as a summary conclusion, the, the line that he would draw would be if the honoring caused any type of um, respect to the shirk or the kufr that they represented. So them as a human being, he would honor them and respect them and treat them you know, uh, 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 with care. Uh, as an example, the, the, the prisoners of Badr. That's actually a, uh, an amazing example. When the prisoners of Badr, the first battle of Islam, they were taken as prisoners, the Prophet ﷺ told the people, because they split each of the captives up. Some people went to some one house, to another house, they were kind of, you know, and he said, feed them like you feed your guests and feed them before you feed yourselves and your family. Now you tell me, if a, here's, a, here's a mushrik who's, who came out that day to kill you and your people, and yet he's saying, now they're in our hands, treat them like a guest, like a guest, and, treat the, and feed them before you feed yourselves, and feed them the best of food. So that to me is like, you know, he's honoring them now, but if it came to 
any type of honoring that would honor their shirk, he would, he, he would not do that. So I think that would be the line that, uh, that I would say just in summary. And I guess one more question, and I know if anybody has to, to leave to pick up their kids, um, you had a question? We ask them. Yeah. Uh, I know that my kids went to public school and, they, and a lot of times, like all of them have this from frustration that in a class, there'll be one or two students, they just want to hear themselves. They have opinions and they'll just talk. And they seem like people have been trained from a young age that your opinion matters. And so it's, it's like a balance that you know, people, they may not have the knowledge and they're just wasting everyone's time because they just want to hear themselves talk. Yeah. Um, so I'm just kind of trying to understand that. Oh yeah, very good question, yeah. So <clears throat> the question was, um, Brother Hasib was saying that his kids went to public school and they said one of the frustrations they had is that there would be sometimes in every class one person who kind of takes over the class. And I think we've all experienced that, you know, whether it's school, work, um, family gatherings. Um, and there's a saying, the empty can rattles the most. So sometimes like the loudest people, the people who don't have anything to say have like lots to say. And our, our politics is a proof of that. I'm going to come to your question because it's really important. Go ahead. What do you mean by taking over the class? Oh, yeah. It's not taking over the class like an even v evil villain and he's going to take over the class. It's just like instead of the teacher talking, that one kid is just like talk, 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 keep, keep talking. So he's like, yeah, that's what he means. That's what I mean by taking over the class. Um, but what I would say is a good point. Yeah, you said that the people are taught that their opinion matters. And so the imbalance in that, which would lead to tyranny, this is where the, the, the term comes like the tyranny of democracy. Like if you let everybody speak, then it becomes a, then it becomes a tyranny because now they're going to be saying things if it's not balanced. So what has to be, what has to happen is there has to be pushback. So if you, if somebody does say something, you know, there has to be room. And that's where the facilitator comes in. So when I was talking about that group, the facilitator, the teacher in this situation, or maybe one of the other students in the classroom or the parent, it's just like, hold, hold on one second. Now we're going to have somebody, you know, uh, respond to that. And they have to, they have to hear that pushback. Um, and that's what's important for, for healthy dialogue that, you know, people present opinions and then they're, they're, they're pushed back. If we don't have that, if we say, okay, we want to prevent all of these opinions from getting out into the, the, the arena, then we don't really know where people stand. So I'll give you an example. There's people who sit silently and listen Sunday schools year after year after year, and the teacher never engages them. And then when they get into high school, they're like, you know what? I don't believe in Islam. Whoa, how did that happen? You know, but maybe if some of those those little inklings of doubt had come up in a in a in an environment where, you know, not saying that this should should happen, but either in the family or in that place, to where it's like, okay, that's what you want to say, and then you respond to it, and then they start like working it out. It's it's worked out rather than waiting for them to get to a situation where there's no where everybody's going everybody's going to say, okay, yeah, your opinion matters, and you can say whatever you want, and freedom of speech and freedom of thought, and so on and so forth. So I would say. Yeah, that's not healthy if just one person takes over the, the, the conversation. There has to be that pushback. But the only way we can have that pushback is we have to, we almost have to take a risk and allow that platform and somebody might say something um, to push back. Does that uh, kind of answer? Yeah. But thank you for mentioning that. I think one more question and we'll yeah. break. <clears throat> You mean our forgiveness of people? The, the concept of forgiveness yeah. and what exactly does that mean? Does it mean as for mental state as well as for like from an action state? What do you do as a person for forgiveness? And what does that mean? Because I read a book that helped me understand more about forgiveness by a professor at Stanford called Forg Forgive for Good. Oh, it's called Forgive for Good? Yeah, it talks about three things. It says you have to address forgiveness, um, you have to address um, the exaggeration of a personal offense to yourself. Mm. Um, the second thing he talks about is um, an obsession of blaming the other person for how you feel. And the third one was um, uh, replaying a grievance story in your head again and again. Oh, wow, yeah. <coughs> it makes you think about that situation and then you replay those feelings all over again. Yeah. But he also mentioned that what forgiveness is not, and he said forgiveness is not necessarily reconciling a relationship with yeah. somebody that hurts you. And I feel like for most Muslim scholars that I hear from, they don't really define what forgiveness means because when I look at the story of, of him um, 
who violated Hamza radiallahu and his body, and the Prophet was told that she converted <coughs> to Islam, and he heard that and he said, that's fine. The, the, short, the shortness, of, he heard that she's, she's Muslim, but he didn't want to meet her. So I feel he created a boundary yeah. where it's like, that's fine. But he was so deeply hurt by that, that he was not bound to say, mashallah, so yeah, 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 no. to Islam and, and like, you know, welcome her to like his inner circle or something. So I feel there's a concept of boundaries that needs to be talked about. But yes, taking care of your feelings, not obsessing over it. But I feel like all these are concepts that need to better understand what is the question was, and again, anybody that has to leave, especially to go pick up the kids, please feel free. Um, uh, but the brother was saying there's a book by um, uh, somebody, you said at Stanford or Berkeley? Yeah, Professor Luskin. Oh, Luskin, yeah, I just looked it up. I'm going to buy it. Um, uh, forgive for Good that talks about, and so you said there was three main concepts that he talks about forgiveness, which the third one is it's not about reconciling, uh, reconciling a, uh, a relationship. It's also about dealing with the emotion or not replaying the emotion. What was the first one? Oh, yeah, not re not exaggerating the. Not taking it too personal. Like, right. I understand that it's about the other. It's about you and the other person, but focusing on yourself, that you take care of your own feelings. Like, yeah, yeah. You, you, you can't control the other person. Right. You okay. Yourself. So you can't control the other person. You can only control yourself, and you're only your reaction to that person. Um, uh, so it sounds like a very interesting book, and I agree that there's not, there, there really isn't a lot of, um, um, uh, at least in readily available material for people to hear the Islamic concept of forgiveness. And you mentioned the story of the, the people who had assassinated the uncle of the Prophet Wasallam, And when he heard that they had become Muslim, he's like, okay, alhamdulillah, they're Muslim, but he doesn't necessarily really want to have the interaction because these are the people who murdered his uncle and you know desecrated his body. So it doesn't mean that, uh, that forgiveness is kind of like, yeah, forgive and forget. There's no, you know, there, there's nothing. Um, and I would, I, I would add a couple of things. You know, the, the point that, he, that you're saying that he's mentioning about letting go, go of that emotion, it's, it's, it's also very healthy for yourself. So when we forgive other people, we're actually doing more of a sadaqah and a charity to ourselves than we are to that person. And, and, and the, the, uh, the right that we have over them on Yom Al-Qiyamah, because, and there's another book where a person, he, he developed a, a non-surgical, non, non non-medicinal method to reverse heart disease. And he just, he does it in three ways, exercise routine, diet routine, and then meditation. And a big part of his meditation is letting go of these resentments. Because he said every time we replay that situation of where somebody harmed us or somebody said something to us, the same, you know, when, when, you, when you get disrespected, insulted by somebody, your body has, an, has a reaction, right? And there's stress hormones that are released and it taxes the system. And so people who are constantly in that situ situation, they get sick more, they age faster, you know, there's a lot of like physiological effects. And he said that every time we think about those situations as well, the body mimics that original response. And so we're flooding the system with like cortisol and other stress hormones. So he said, you're actually doing yourself a benefit by just letting those things go. So there is that element. And, and at the same time, though, uh, Imam Al-Qurtubi mentions, he says, when we talk about forgiveness, he says, this is for the person who's not consistently and continuously harming people. This is for the person who harmed, recognized them did, and they, they're asking for forgiveness. Whereas, what would happen if we had a, a, uh, a habitual harmer, a habitual abuser? And then they do something, oh, you, I, you're forgiven. I forgive you for the sake of Allah. If we keep doing that, what is it going to do for that person? Reinforcing. They have a name for it. It's called enabling. Right now they say enabling. So Imam Al-Qurtubi says, you know, where the Quran says, ta'fu khayrun lakum, that when you, to, to pardon a person is better for you. He says, this is only in the situations where it's like a one-off situation. The person made a mistake. They're, they're, they're remorseful. Or even if they're not remorseful, it's still, it was a one-off thing. Uh, but it's not that they're habitual. He said, if they're habitual, no, you demand your right. And that could be in the dunya, and it could also be in the akhirah. And sometimes, by, sometimes f for some people, they need to be like woken up by that reminder of what's to come in the akhirah. I had a friend who in Mauritania, he walked into a store and some, some guy was uh, uh, smoking a cigarette and just kind of like, you know, 
making fun of, of these two students who had come in from, from the Badia, from, from the countryside. And it's like, oh yeah, you guys are, you know, some of those religious students and so forth. It was, was joking, it was, was humiliating them and saying something. Frustrated, he looked at him, he says, Sa'araka yom al qiyamah. I'll see you on the day of judgment. And that person, he said, he like, his cigarette dropped and he was like, like it, it took, it, it, uh, it, it shocked him. Now, for a believer, you could say that, right? Because that shows that they have enough belief that like, oh yeah, that's right, there's a Yom al Qiyamah. If I hurt somebody else, so, so it affected him. But he wasn't like, oh brother, it's okay, I forgive you. Because he was like, oh yeah, he might have like continued in the, in the, in the, uh, the humiliation. But by him saying, Sa'araka Yom al Qiyamah, I'll see you on the day of judgment, it, it, it stopped him. Uh, so it is a balance, and I'll say it, it's situational. I'm going to read this book, uh, and there's a couple of other. Uh, of Maybe I'll make that a topic next inshallah. Um, and if anybody reads anything about forgiveness or like how we can have a more, um, more of a framework to where it's not just like as Muslims we forgive and we forgive whatever. No, there's some details. Let's fill in those details inshallah. Yeah. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika nashadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.